All right, this podcast is going to be about the second type of passive transport that we've been learning about. And the second type is called osmosis. So if you remember, the first type we learned about was called diffusion. This next type of passive transport is called osmosis. And there will be a third part that we'll get to tomorrow. So just to review a little bit, our first type of passive transport was called diffusion. And you have all these notes from before. Diffusion is when molecules move from an area of high concentration to an area where they are in a low concentration. This does not use any energy from the cell. Um, you did a lab with this on Friday where you tested this through water, that corn syrup, and through the air. And you saw that the molecules go from where they're in a high concentration, right in the middle of your Petri dish, and they'll spread out to where they're in a low concentration. That's diffusion of that food coloring or diffusion of that air freshener. Remember, diffusion is going to stop once equilibrium is reached. That means all of the materials are equally spread out throughout the container or throughout the cell. And once equilibrium happens, molecules keep moving. Okay, that's something you should have wrote down in those analysis questions, but they don't all move in one direction. Okay, they're just moving around randomly and evenly. The next type of passive transport that we need to learn about, here's an illustration of what you did. So everything's nice. Here's equilibrium. They're still moving around, but it's an equal movement called equilibrium. That's what you did in your little petri dish with the water. Our next type of passive transport is called osmosis. You already have this definition here. Osmosis is the diffusion of water. And the reason why we have a name for this is because cells are made mostly of water. They're typically in a watery environment, whether it's your bloodstream or if it's an organism living in a pond or something like that. So water is going to diffuse an awful lot, and because it's so important, it has its own name, and that's called osmosis. Now, we're talking about water diffusing. So water is going to move from where water is in a high concentration to where water is in a lower concentration. That's what osmosis is. We're focusing just on the water. We're not focusing on the food coloring or the, the nutrients or the oxygen or anything else. We're watching what the water is doing. Is it leaving the cell or coming into the cell? So water wants to reach equilibrium too. Now, if you have a high concentration of water, that means that things are watered down. So that means you don't have a whole lot of solutes. Think about hot chocolate. If there's a lot of water in your hot chocolate, that means you don't have a whole lot of hot cocoa mix. All right, so high concentration of water means low concentration of solutes. So make sure you're writing these things here down. If you have a low concentration of water, that would mean you have a lot of solutes. So when you're making hot chocolate, if you put like three packages into your water, or if you use less water and just make one package, you're concentrating your hot cocoa. So that means you have more solutes and less water. So whenever there's less water concentration, there's going to be more solutes. And so that's what that's all about. And make sure you write all these down. All right. So here's an example of how osmosis works, and you'll have a similar picture in your textbook, but they basically take this tube that has 10% solutes right here, and they put it into an area where there's, uh, there's a higher water concentration, and as you can see, these clear ones are the waters. And what they're going to do, there's more higher concentration of clear waters here, and there's a lower concentration of clear waters here. So the waters, by just bumping into each other, are going to get moved up into here. They're going to continue to do this until the concentration of water down here is equal to the concentration of water up here. And that's what this picture is trying to show you. Um, now, some of these solutes, they're going to want to move here too because they're going to want to reach their own equilibrium. So water is going to go from where it's more highly concentrated to where it's in a lower concentration. And then those solutes are going to do the same thing. All right. Osmosis kind of sets itself up with cells in three different situations. We're going to go through the three here. The first one is called an isotonic solution. And let me pop all this up here for you. In an isotonic solution, the concentration of water inside the cell is equal to the concentration of water outside the cell. So water is already in equilibrium with its environment in the cell. So 
inside the cell, the water concentration is the same as it is in your bloodstream or in the pond or in the lake or wherever this, whatever watery environment this cell seems to be sitting in. So water, as you see from this picture, water does move in, but because it's in equilibrium, the equal amount will get bumped out. And this is all due to those intermolecular collisions. Okay, they're randomly bumping each other, but because the water is already in equilibrium, as one gets bump, bumped in, one gets bumped out. And this down here would be a plant cell. And it's the same thing. As water diffuses across that cell wall and cell membrane, it's going to create more water down in here. It's going to cause one to get bumped out. And that's called an isotonic solution. If you wear contact lenses, take a look at your contact lens bottle, whatever you clean your contacts with. And what it's going to say on it is that it's a sterile. That means it has no bacteria or any kind of cells in it. That's good. You don't want that going into your eyes. It's going to say a sterile isotonic solution used for the cleaning and disinfecting of lenses. That's good because you want that contact lens solution when it's up against your eyeballs to be nice and isotonic with your cells. And you're going to see why it would be bad to put just pure water into your eyes or into your contacts or to put salt water in there. We're going to see that on the next two slides. All right, so that's an isotonic solution. Everything's in equilibrium. Another way that cells uh, do osmosis with their environment is called a hypotonic solution. So I'll put all this up here for you. In a hypotonic solution, the concentration of water molecules is higher outside of the cell. And that means it's lower inside the cell. So what happens is because the water concentration is higher outside the cell, it wants to reach equilibrium with the inside of the cell. So by intermolecular moving, the waters are going to get bumped inside the cell until they reach equilibrium. It's almost like leaving a water balloon on the hose for too long. It's going to swell, 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 swell. The cells could eventually burst, as you can see here, because the cell can only swell so much before that cell membrane ruptures. And in cells in a hypotonic solution can swell and they can break. Um, I'm gonna, you're going to do an example of this once this uh, presentation is over about how a woman actually died from this. Um, it's called water intoxication. And it's where someone drinks so much water so quickly, like gallons of water, and they don't let themselves go to the bathroom for whatever reason. And what happens is you can get a whole lot of water in your bloodstream. Your kidneys usually remove this, but in these bizarre situations, sometimes it can't remove it fast enough. And if this was a brain cell, the fluid around your brain has way too much water in it, and the water keeps entering your brain cells, causing them to burst. If they burst, they die, and people die from brain damage from this. It happens every so often. Like I said, you're going to read an article about it and answer me a couple of questions, but this can become very serious. Remember we said the plant cell wall gives them protection? This is what it protects against. They have this super strong cell wall. It will not burst. So plants are protected against this bursting because that cell wall is so strong it won't rupture. Okay, so even though water may be entering them, if a plant is sitting uh, in a puddle or something like that, its cells won't burst like ours will because they have that super strong cell wall on the outside. All right, our last osmotic uh, situation is a hypertonic solution. Let me pop all this up for you again. Cells in a hypertonic solution, what happens here is the concentration of water outside the cell is lower than inside the cell. So come over here to the picture with me. Because the water concentration here is higher inside the cell, water wants to reach equilibrium without here. So water is going to leave the cell and go into the surrounding environment. Well, that means it's almost like the cell has a leak in it, okay? It doesn't. It's just that the water is being drawn out of it due to the diffusion of water, due to osmosis. So the water is going to leave. It's going to go out here, and the cell is going to shrivel up, okay? And that's what I wrote down here. Cells placed in a hypertonic solution will shrivel. Down here in this plant cell, you can see the cell wall is kind of indented. It has shriveled. It's not going to completely collapse because it's too strong. But look here, the cell membrane has pulled away because it's losing its water. That is, uh, it doesn't have the water to keep its shape anymore, so it just kind of does that. So that is uh, what happens in a hypertonic solution. Um, let me give you an example of this that maybe you've done before. I know you guys appreciate my amazing artwork here. So... Here's a slug. 
And I know some of you have poured salt on a slug before. And it looks like the slug is melting. It's not melting. So here's our salt shaker. Here's our slug. All right. You pour a thick layer of salt all over the back of this slug. Now, a slug skin is not like ours. Okay, our, our skin is pretty thick. It's dead on the outside. It gives us a lot of protection. We make a layer of oil to protect us from certain things. Slugs don't do any of that. They have a very thin skin. And when you pour that uh, layer of salt on top of them, well, the concentration of water inside the cell is higher, inside the slug cells, I should say, is higher than out here because this is just pure salt. So the H2O concentration here is much lower. So water wants to reach equilibrium. So the water is going to leave the slug cells and go into this layer of salt. It's going, this water's trying to reach equilibrium with that layer of salt. Well, as you can imagine, it, there's, it would take more water than the slug has to reach equilibrium with that layer of salt. So what happens is this, all the slug cells do this and it looks like the slug melts. It's not really melting. And what you're doing is you're just dehydrating that slug in a matter of like five seconds. Okay, and it looks like the whole slug kind of collapses and melts. You've actually made a, hyp a hypertonic solution on the back of that uh, slug. It draws all the water out of the cells and it kills the slug um, and it kind of just dehydrates it right in front of your eyes. So that's an example of a hypertonic solution. Okay, water concentration is higher inside the cells. Water is going to leave the cells to try to reach equilibrium with the environment. All right, so here's all three of these cases right next to each other. Um, so remember, we said um, you're going to do an example of this one in just a minute. Uh, this here would be like contact lens solution. Or even if you've ever had an IV of fluids, uh, if you ever had surgery or something like that, an IV is called a saline solution. And what it is, is it's water mixed with a little bit of salt to make it isotonic. If uh, a doctor or nurse just put water into your veins, this would be happening to your cells. You don't want that. So they mix it with a little bit of salt to keep it nice and isotonic. And that is what contact lens solution and what an IV would be um, to keep your cells nice and healthy, okay? And then a hypertonic solution, we talked about the slug. We have more water inside the cell than out. Water is going to want to leave. Solutes are going to want to enter because the solute concentration is higher out here. So we're dehydrating cells that way. All right, and if you've ever had, a, you know, ham, or any kind of like Italian meats like pepperonis or uh, salamis, things like that, a lot of times they're very salty. Before refrigeration, they would salt foods to preserve them, to keep bacteria and fungus from growing on them and causing them to rot or just to uh, decompose and decay and go bad. Well, when you put a whole lot of salt into these meats, so I don't know, take this hunk of meat here that's hanging in the window. This is very heavily salted. Let's say a bacterial cell lands on this and it wants to use that as food. Well, guess what? This bacterial cell has more water in it than the salted meat around it does. So water is going to leave the bacterial cell, go into the meat, and the bacterial cell is going to dehydrate and die, just like those slug cells do. So that's why salted meats like that, they don't need to be refrigerated because you're preserving them by adding a ton of solutes to them. And any decomposer that lands on them is immediately dried out and killed by the high salt content. That's why when you have ham or something like that, you get really thirsty afterwards because as you're chewing that up and swallowing it, it's drawing water out of the cells of your mouth, the cells of your throat, and it makes your body send a message to you that you're thirsty so that you can replace that water. Okay? Um, and there you have it. That is osmosis. It is the third type of, or sorry, the second type of passive transport that we're going to talk about. And you're going to do an activity about it right now. So feel free to rewatch this. The notes are available on Moodle. Uh, the podcast would be right underneath the notes. And please let me know if you have any questions.